Great. Um, uh, so uh, I, I'd like to tell you about the making of London's West End. Um, uh, by the way, if, if Mark, if uh, these slides don't go up and down, just do, do tell me, okay? Um, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, and as Mark was saying, uh, uh, this uh, talk is uh, derived from my uh, new history of the West End of London. Uh, and I'm delighted to talk to uh, uh, a, such a, obviously a vibrant society uh, such as yours, which is devoted to the history of, well, Streatham, but of London. Now, of course, um, I, I could not be more uh, d delighted uh, to, to do this. Um, why did I write this book? Um, well, quite simply, um, uh, I've the book is derived from my lifelong love of the West End of London. Uh, and I wanted to read a history of the West End. Uh, and I found that nobody had written one. So I therefore thought, well, in that case, I better write it. So this, this, is, um, uh, this book is the result. It goes from 1800 up to 1914. I am now at work on the second volume, uh, which will go from 1914 up to the present, um, uh, up to at least the COVID crisis, and maybe a little bit, I hope a little bit beyond that. Um, so, um, so that's how I came to write the book. Um, and um, given that uh, the West End has delighted millions over the years. It seems to me important that uh, there should be a history of, the, of it. And it, I want, I've tried to write the London history that has never been written. So that's what this is about. And what I've tried to understand is not just the history of the West End, but I've tried to understand its special qualities, its special pleasures. Another way into the West End, um, come is for me is my lifelong love of the Victorians. Um, uh, some people uh, think that the Victorians were kind of po-faced pleasure denying Puritans. But at a very early age, I came across this painting, which some of you may know, which I hope you can see on the screen, um, uh, by the artist J.O. Parry. Now it's, it's got a rather dull title, A London Street Scene. Uh, but what you can see uh, are, uh, is a wall um, embellished with posters um, for shows that are on in London. And I should say that these uh, shows that you can see um, uh, advertised uh, are all real shows. They were actually be, uh, being performed in about 1834, 1835. So it is almost like a, do uh, it is a, a, a true document of the 1830s. And what I take from this is that the Victorians helped invent modern show business. And I'm now going to share with you my favorite photograph in, the, in, in my book, which really uh, moves on from this. This is the back of the Adelphi Theatre in Leicester Square, uh, which was the most uh, popular of all West End music halls. It was a top class variety house. And here you, you can see um, embellished all these one, uh, wonderful posters, um, you know, for the Alhambra, for, the, for Daly's Theatre, for Her Majesty's Theatre. Uh, and in a sense, the story I want to tell is all in this photograph. How did we get to, uh, to this uh, place that is advertised by these magnificent images? Well, first of all, uh, I better say, what do I mean by the West End? Because I think the way, um, different people interpret it in different ways. By the West End, I mean the pleasure district, that clustering of different forms of entertainment and spectacular forms of retail that you get in the center of London. So um, uh, 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 it may not be very clear from this map, but I take the, uh, the West End to uh, uh, run from Bond Street on the west, Oxford Street on the north, what is now Kingsway on the east, and the river or the Strand on the south. That is how I'm uh, defining the West End, because I think that area um, has a particular character to it, um, based upon the provision of different forms of spectacular entertainment. Um, by 1900, 
the West End had acquired many of its modern day characteristics. There was a constellation of theatres, restaurants, dance halls, billboard hoardings, music halls, pubs, uh, galleries and grand hotels. And it is my contention this evening um, that uh, these things were not separate, they were linked in various ways because they offered an experience based on mass entertainment and retail. They aroused the senses in different ways through taste, through light, through visual spectacle, through music. Um, they create an environment that is larger than life. In 1900, it was possible to shop at Liberty's. It was uh, on Regent Street. You could dine at the Criterion on Piccadilly Circus. You could catch Henry Irving's revival of the great melodrama, The Bells at the Lyceum Theatre. Uh, and you could stay the night at the Savoy Hotel. Um, and in, incidentally, um, if some of you, you can see the picture of the Savoy uh, in the bottom right. Some of you may be thinking that doesn't look like the entrance to the Savoy Hotel. Um, and that's because you, we're all familiar with the, the, the current entrance um, to the Savoy Hotel, which is on the Strand. But the original uh, entrance um, uh, to the Savoy was around the back. You got into it uh, from the Victoria Embankment. So this is the original entrance to the Savoy. So if we were in 1900, we, uh, we would um, recognize a lot of what comprises the West End today. Uh, by uh, a few years earlier in 1893, Eros had been erected on Piccadilly Circus, that great icon of the West End. Um, already in 1900, um, people were beginning to talk about a new invention that was spreading fast the kinematograph or the cinema. Um, shortly afterwards, neon uh, uh, advertisements uh, were, would brighten up the night sky in Piccadilly Circus. Uh, the first advertisement was for Perrier Water. The second was for Bovril. Um, uh, if we open the pages of the Caterer and Hotel Keepers Gazette, uh, a more interesting periodical than it sounds, um, we would find commentaries on the vast number of American tourists in the West End. And if we read Conan Doyle's A Study in Scarlet, we will find that it was in the Criterion Bar that Dr. John Watson first heard the name Sherlock Holmes. But 100 years earlier, in 1800, this notion of the West End as a pleasure district barely existed. So what made the West End and what turned it into the pleasure district that it is today? That is what I want to explore with you. I'm going to argue that um, the development of the West End was the consequence of London's changing role as a world city in the 19th century. The West End also came into being in order to please and gratify a middle-class public. Um, now, when I say that London was a world city, well, to, of course, to some extent, London has been a world city, arguably, since the Elizabethans. Um, but, um, but when I describe it as a world city, I'm trying to get at the way in which, at the end of the day, you don't compare London with, say, Middlesbrough. You compare London with New York or Paris or Tokyo. Those are world cities linked by international networks of finance, fashion, taste and culture. They create a distinctive cosmopolitan atmosphere. Uh, but if we go back to 1800, uh, there was certainly an embryonic West End, um, but essentially um, the area served as a playground for the aristocracy. It served the pleasure needs of the elite, particularly through the great patent theatres on Drury Lane and Covent Garden. 
and the opera house on the Haymarket, um, which, uh, which is now Her Majesty's Theatre. Um, now, in the 19th century, pleasure quite simply became democratized. It became more available to all. Um, now, by that, I don't mean um, that everything in the West End uh, could be purchased or enjoyed by everybody. And yet, everybody could find something to entertain them. Hence, of course, we think about um, East Enders going up West. Um, and yet, the characteristic of the West End in the 19th century, or for much of the 19th century, was that it exists to serve a distinctive figure, the man about town. Somebody who was um, uh, perhaps an aristocrat, uh, 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 certainly a gentleman, certainly somebody with a significant income. And so the pleasures of the West End, certainly in the first half of the 19th century and later on, were really aimed at figures like this. So, so it's very, the, the West End was very much a masculine um, environment in the first half of the 19th century. Um, uh, and I think this is why the West, the, the man about town has always remained a kind of fantasy figure. I mean, even sort of James Bond is a kind of man about town. Um, uh, and, uh, and the man about town then generated the kinds of figures you found um, uh, embodied in the West End. Figures like at the end of the 19th century, the actor Charles Wyndham, who was perhaps the original matinee idol. Uh, he uh, was famous for the farces that he acted in at the Criterion on Piccadilly Circus. And then he had his own theatre built for him on the Charing Cross Road. And of course, it's still there, Wyndham, the Wyndham's Theatre. Um, and again, so people like Wyndham really expressed the kind, this kind of world of male luxury. Now, I think there are three points of origin that create the West End as we have come to know it. And we can detect them at the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century. The first was in 1794, when the artist Robert Barker built his panorama uh, in Leicester Square. Now, let me first of all say something about Leicester Square. Leicester Square in the 18th century had been very much a smart address. It was the uh, site of the huge palace, uh, Leicester House. And yet by the end of the 18th century, the aristocrats who had been living there were moving on, usually pursuing smart residences in Mayfair and St. James's. And so instead, by the end of the 18th century, Leicester Square became um, a, a site of shops aimed at the discerning middle-class consumer. Um, and that was the audience that Robert Barker was trying to attract with his panorama. So what was the panorama? A, a, a word he invented, by the way. Well, quite simply, panoramas were vast paintings often on a cylindrical canvas. Um, and they were not just on a, a large scale, but they could be enhanced with elaborate uh, lighting effects. And uh, if you look closely, you, uh, you can see, uh, this is um, Robert Barker's panorama. You'll see there are actually two panoramas, uh, one on top of the other. And if you look at the figures in this picture, you can get a, a sense of the scale of these spectacular images that were created. Um, uh, and, and what did uh, audiences find when they went to the panorama? They found large, uh, um, uh, great spectacles of landscapes uh, and gl global landmarks and places of natural beauty. Um, the proprietor of the um, uh, uh, panorama uh, sent artists off all over Europe and indeed the world to take sketches so that the panoramas that they created back in London could be absolutely authentic. Um, and uh, although they also fed a love of the exotic. Now, the, the scale of these paintings 
was part of their appeal. Um, when the panorama was launched in 1794, uh, none other than George III attended um, to see the huge panorama of the fleet at Spithead. And Queen Charlotte was known to say afterwards that the effect of looking at the panorama made her seasick. Um, now, the tragedy of the panorama as a form is that they were so vast that very few of them uh, survived. There is one in The Hague, um, uh, but they, just, uh, they were just too big to store. So we don't really have any anymore. Um, but here is um, a, a picture from the brochure uh, that accompanied the panorama of Cairo. Um, that gives you a bit of a sense of why people um, uh, came to, the, to um, the panorama. And of course, this is an age without film or television. So for a lot of people, this was actually the closest they could get to looking at some of these foreign locations. I think that the effect of going to the panorama was similar uh, to the effect of, say, going to see a film on an IMAX screen today. Um, and, and if you think about that kind of immersive nature of going to see a film on a large, uh, on a large screen, that captures something of the um, appeal of the panorama. And Leicester Square, I should say, then became uh, known as a great center for exhibitions uh, of all sorts and galleries. Uh, and it's one reason why Prince Albert originally thought of locating the great exhibition in Leicester Square. Um, he changed his mind later on, and of course they moved it to Hyde Park. So uh, the coming of the panorama, um, I think is important because it cr created uh, the idea of the West End as a site of spectacular entertainment. Another point of origin, I would say, was the opening of the Adelphi Theatre on the Strand um, in 1806. It was actually originally called the Son Paré, without equal. Um, so that explains why you'll, you'll see the name the Son Paré, but it, it's the Adelphi Theatre uh, as we know it, although I, I better say uh, the Adelphi Theatre as we know it is actually, I think, the third or fourth building on that site. Um, and the, the current Adelphi Theatre uh, dates from the 1930s, so it's not the same building. Um, but the original Saint Paré or Adelphi was built by a merchant called John Scott, who wanted to show off the singing, singing talents of his daughter, Jane Scott. And so he transformed his warehouse on the Strand into a theatre. And he turned his daughter into a big star for the time. And in fact, we now see Jane Scott as one of the pioneers of the West End. Um, and what, uh, what would you have seen if you'd gone to the Saint Paré in 1806? Um, uh, well, Jane Scott sang uh, songs brilliantly. She put on her own plays. She also put on Phantasmagoria. Um, and these were magic lantern shows which used special effects uh, and employed light and silhouettes. Um, for example, the first night offered a, a, a phantasmagoria called Tempest Terrific. Um, and in some ways, I think these phantasmagoria anticipated the cinema, or at least um, excited the passion for projected images that the um, cinema would later fulfill. But the Adelphi also became known for other kinds of entertainment um, uh, and forms of storytelling. Um, it offered musical burletters, operas, light operas, um, and melodrama, the great theatrical form of the 19th century. Now, the context of all of this is that uh, theater was essentially the television of the 19th century. All classes went. And yet, um, from the restoration of 1660 onwards, strictly speaking, the spoken word in theater was restricted to the theater's royal. Um, in other words, the theater royal in Drury Lane, Theatre Royal in Covent Garden, the opera 
in the hay market. Um, uh, and technically, every other um, form of theater was illegal because they were not allowed to um, perform the spoken word. Um, and these so-called minor theaters like the Adelphi got round this by saying they were essentially offering musical entertainments. And fortunately for them, uh, magistrates found it very difficult to prosecute them. Uh, so this is why they got round this, uh, got round the law. And the law was not changed until 1843, where, uh, uh, whereupon the spoken word uh, be uh, became, uh, could be uh, used in any uh, theater. Um, now, one of the biggest hits uh, of the early Adelphi Theatre, and by this time it was the Adelphi Theatre, was in 1821. Uh, the Adelphi put on a dramatization of Pierce Egan's novel, Life in London. Now, this was the story of two men about town and their exploits, which involved um, uh, gambling and slumming it in the dens of the poor. Um, and their names were the, the names of the two men about town, who, as I said, were kind of iconic figures of the period. Uh, their names uh, were Tom and Jerry. And so there was a dramatization uh, put on in 1821 uh, of, um, uh, of life in London, and it was called Tom and Jerry. Uh, and it ran for 100 evenings, which was a very long run at a time when most plays were performed for only two or three nights. And, and so I see Tom and Jerry um, as uh, pointing to a future where the West End would eventually be associated with long running shows. Um, and today the West End is um, made up not just of theatres, but of shows that become that have become monuments in their own right. Les Miserables, The Woman in Black, uh, The Phantom of the Opera, Mamma Mia, and of course, The Mousetrap. So in a sense, that kind of long running show really starts with Tom and Jerry uh, in 1821. And the question I often get asked is, is there any link between um, uh, uh, Tom and Jerry and Pierce Egan and um, the cartoon characters, uh, Tom and Jerry. And the answer is, there is. Um, um, Tom and Jerry, the show, was so popular that a, a, a drink was named after it, uh, a Tom and Jerry. It was a, a cocktail that you drank at Christmas and it became very popular. Uh, it was also became very popular at um, in the United States of America. Uh, even in the 1920s, um, uh, President Warren Harding would serve uh, a, a Tom and Jerry to his guests at Christmas. Uh, and the cartoon characters are named after the drink, which of course is then derived from the show. So there is actually a link um, between Tom and Jerry um, uh, in, uh, as the creations of Pierce Egan and as performed at the Adelphi and the cartoon characters. A third point of origin would be the building of Regent Street. Um, now, this was one of the most, um, uh, 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 one of the rare examples of the construction of a planned environment in London. As you know, the growth of London was always a, a bit of a mess. Um, but Regent Street was designed by the Prince Regent and his architect, John Nash, who wanted to connect Regent's Park and Carlton House. Um, uh, now, the central section between Piccadilly Circus um, and uh, Oxford Street was designed as a shopping district. And um, Piccadilly Circus at that point was called Regent Circus. Now, these shops in the central section uh, of um, Regent Street were not, uh, not uh, in, were not just for any old uh, customers. They were meant uh, designed to be high end shops serving the elite of Mayfair and St James's. So these were shops that were intended to provide luxury goods. Um, but also, uh, Regent Street was meant to create a frontier 
between the aristocratic world of Mayfair and the more downmarket world of Soho. Um, and that distinction is even um, evident today. And the atmosphere of one part, or one side of Regent Street is very different from that on, of the other side. Um, and I think the important thing about Regent Street is how wide it is. Um, and that was a very deliberate decision by John Nash, because he wanted to create that frontier between the aristocracy and the rest. That was the purpose of Regent Street. And he succeeded in creating a street for prestige shopping. Let me show you uh, a picture of Regent Street from just a little bit earlier than this picture. Um, and what you see are the colonnades on that on the beautiful uh, curve with the so-called quadrant that uh, John Nash um, uh, designed. I, I still think the curve of Regent Street is one of the great beautiful, most beautiful sites in London. Uh, and you'll see these uh, the colonnades that were there. Um, and of course, as I'm sure you realize, they're not there now. What happened to them? Um, quite the, the problem with the colonnades is that, as you can see, they looked very spectacular. But then prostitutes started to um, uh, um, uh, 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 solicit customers underneath them because they could get out of the rain, essentially. Um, and, uh, and their shopkeepers complained <clears throat> that the um, colonnades were allowing prostitution to take place. And eventually, the, in 1848, the, the colonnades were removed. <clears throat> However, um, some of them were then transferred to one side of the Theatre Royal Drury Lane. If you know the, the Theatre Royal, uh, on one side, you do get these wonderful colonnades, and they are the colonnades um, from Regent Street. <clears throat> now, um, <clears throat> Regent Street simply offered the, the, the top shops in London, or some of them. Um, there were, uh, for example, uh, Medkins at number 86 in the 1850s, who made sure that everybody knew that he was Prince Albert's bootmaker. Or Piver at number 160 was a French perfumier who also had a shop on the Boulevard de Strasbourg in, um, in Paris. So Regent Street seemed like a conduit to the best of French taste um, at a time when France and Paris in particular uh, still set trends in fashion and food. Um, and it wasn't just Regent Street, just around the corner on, on Piccadilly, you got uh, in 1819, the construction of the Burlington Arcade. Again, an attempt to create a, a, a space for upmarket shopping, where again, the best of luxury goods could be purchased, but also where if people wish to, they could just go to window shop. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, so what I've shown you is that in the early 19th century, the West End possessed some anticipations of what it would become, but it was still essentially a place aimed at the aristocracy. <clears throat> so what changed? I argue in my book that the West End, as we know it, emerged roughly between 1850 and, eight, and 1900. What was it that brought about change? And one I, argument I make is that the, one of the forces that changed the West End was ladies' lavatories. Um, actually, I am serious about this. I mean, a lot of other things create the West End, but um, <clears throat> the lack of lavatories for women um, put a break on women's mobility, the able to, ability to access uh, the West End, because simply it was very difficult for, uh, for them to find anywhere uh, to, uh, to go, uh, go for, uh, to the loo. Um, and the London vestries um, <clears throat> for much of the 19th century quite simply refused to provide ladies lavatories. Um, uh, uh, many theatres uh, didn't ha uh, provide ladies' lavatories. Um, and even today, as I'm sure you all know, of course, um, uh, ladies' lavatories are cramped in, in West End theatres, and there are not enough of them, hence the long queue outside the ladies' loo during in the interval of plays. <clears throat> um, so what then began to change that, uh, that situation? Well, here's the significance of the rise of the department store in the second half of the 19th century. Uh, places like, say, John Lewis um, and uh, um, or Liberties. Uh, 
And one of the characteristics of department stores is that they provided ladies' lavatories. In fact, uh, often they didn't provide gentlemen's lavatories, but they did provide ladies' lavatories. Um, and so that meant a, a, a middle-class woman, perhaps from the suburbs, knew she could come into town, could go shopping at a department store, and also knew that she could go to the lavatory. Um, and, um, and I think that one of the forces, quite simply, that makes the modern West End is that it becomes increasingly feminized. Women are able to claim the West End. It, is not, it was not just a space for men about town. Um, then the, the uh, mid-Victorian West End was the product of structural and technological changes sweeping through the Victorian city. We see uh, the construction of new streets, particularly Shaftesbury Avenue in the 1880s. We saw um, uh, improvements in street lighting and cleaning and better local government and improved policing. So it was safe for middle-class people to enter. But above all, the West End was the construction of the communications revolution of the mid 19th century. I mean that in two senses. It was the product of the railway age. Um, the railways made it easier for people uh, from the suburbs and from out of town to access the West End. Um, Here's Charing Cross Station. Um, and, um, uh, and of course, another characteristic of uh, railway stations is that they provided lavatories. And then the West End was the construction, was a part of a communications revolution because it was the um, creation of the British press. Um, it was the press that, for example, promoted first nights in the West End, in West End theatres, and made them uh, sound like um, uh, uh, spectacular events, uh, great premieres. Um, so now we have a situation where perhaps many people in, the, in, in other parts of the country, uh, say in Huddersfield, can be more familiar with what's going on in London theatre than they can, than they're familiar with what's going on in their own local theatre. All of that is to do with the growth of the press. Um, and of course, it's also to do with the fact that you see in the mid 19th century, the commercialization of leisure. Uh, the West End became a laboratory of modern popular culture, um, where pleasure was turned into a business. Who were the entrepreneurs uh, who made the West End? Well, I'm gonna show you a few of them. Uh, uh, there was George Edwards, um, who uh, was in, um, in many ways the Cameron Mackintosh of his day. Um, he uh, uh, owned uh, uh, the Gaiety Theatre, uh, Daly's Theatre, uh, and the Empire Leicester Square. And it was George Edwards who invented uh, that curious form, the musical comedy, um, and, uh, and, and made a, a fortune from supplying musical comedies on the West End, like this one, an artist's model, which was at Daly's Theatre in Leicester Square. The theatre, alas, is no longer, uh, no longer with us. Or another pioneer of the West End on the left <coughs> uh, was Eliza Vestris, um, who um, <coughs> was a theatre manager. She ran the Olympic Theatre on Witch Street. <coughs> Witch Street was then, uh, was later on demolished to make way for the old witch. That's where it would have, would have been um, now. Um, and what's interesting about Eliza Vestris, she was an act, a, a, a popular actress, um, uh, but also uh, uh, she ran her own theatres. <clears throat> and it's interesting that theatre in the 19th century was one area where women could participate uh, as business people, more or less on the same terms as men. And then on the right, we have someone rather different. We have Madame Wharton, um, <clears throat> who um, offered tableau vivant or pose plastique on Leicester Square. Quite simply, um, <clears throat> she put on shows where uh, actors uh, uh, put on representations of classical paintings. Um, and, um, and of course, one of the characteristics of many classical paintings is, of course, they feature nudity. And you'd get actors uh, who were not naked, but or, um, uh, were clothed in flesh-colored body stockings, so that they gave the appearance of nudity. 
And so I argue this was effectively the uh, Victorian equivalent of striptease. Um, and so, th and this is uh, Madame Wharton uh, putting on a representation of Landseer's painting of Lady Godiva. And here she is again in a, in a picture where she plays the role of innocence. Again, you have the, um, a, a sort of simulated uh, uh, nudity, uh, reminding us, of course, that sexuality, of course, is a major feature of the, of the pleasure district, and it was in the Victorian period. <clears throat> then again, someone rather different, um, Cesar Ritz, the hotelier who made the reputation of uh, the Savoy Hotel. Um, and, um, uh, and Ritz uh, uh, um, built up a network of hotels, um, which some of which he owned, uh, but and some of which he ran. Um, so um, the, the Savoy uh, Hotel was owned by Richard Doyley Cart, um, who had um, made his money from the Gil great Gilbert and Sullivan operettas. And he brought in um, Cesar Ritz to run the Savoy, <clears throat> which he did, uh, and, uh, and he gave him the mission of attracting the international plutocracy uh, in the 1880s, which he did. Uh, amongst other things, Ritz insisted that um, uh, this new hotel, the Savoy, would have to offer a, um, a, a bathroom uh, in every single uh, suite, in every room, would have its own, if you like, what we would call en suite bathroom. Uh, this had never been done before. Uh, and um, uh, and uh, for example, um, uh, just around the corner uh, on Trafalgar Square, um, there was uh, the Tra uh, Trafalgar Hotel, uh, and uh, that could house um, uh, 500 people. Um, so there were 500 people in the Trafalgar Hotel and five bathrooms. Okay, so so this is why the Savoy was a revolution in terms of hotel. Uh, and when um, Doyle Cart and Ritz told the architect they wanted a, um, a bathroom in every, um, in, in every guest room, uh, the architect was, uh, uh, said, um, uh, these guests of yours, are they uh, by any chance amphibious? Um, this was such an unusual idea. So again, we see uh, the West End as a site of change. Ironically, the one hotel that um, Ritz, Cesar Ritz didn't have much to do with was, you guessed it, the Ritz. Uh, but that's because his, his career was um, uh, in decline by that time. But these were very much the figures who made the West End. Um, now, um, the character of the West End was created by what I call monumentalism or spectacle, uh, or the, the term I use in the book is what I call the populist palatial. Um, and that's why I think the West End is this curious con combination of ostentation and vulgarity. Um, and I'm not just talking about spectacular theatres, putting on spectacular shows, I'm talking about spectacular shops with new forms of display. Uh, with shop windows, posters, advertisements. In other words, I'm talking about Selfridges, um, which the American entrepreneur Harry Gordon Selfridge um, uh, created at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, but then, um, I'm all, in terms of the, the construction of the West End, I'm also thinking about uh, the great theatre architects who, create, uh, who made it. Uh, figures like W.G. Sprague, who built um, uh, eight theatres in the West End, including the Wyndham's Theatre. And I'm talking about this gentleman, Frank Matcham, who uh, designed and built the Colosseum, which was in, uh, well, yeah, and is the largest theatre in London. <laughs> um, and it was designed to flatter middle-class audiences and stimulate the senses. Um, uh, so Oswald Stoll, who owned the theatre, uh, insisted that the Colosseum, which was originally an upmarket variety house, had to put on four shows a day and uh, in a spectacular location, which I hope this picture uh, conveys. 
Um, and, and this was a time of astonishing spectacle on the West End stage. Um, at the Lyceum, for example, at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, they put on, they put on Ben-Hur and they did the chariot race on stage with real horses. I think most of us would have paid to see that. Um, but, and the populist palatial as a style, I think was evident in that um, great popular form of the late 19th century, the music hall. In many ways, the music hall that was to some extent invented in uh, the West End, although there are arguments about that. But let's take um, the Alhambra Theatre of Varieties in Leicester Square. It had originally started in 1854 uh, as a, a building called the Royal Panopticon of Science and Art. Um, and it was designed as essentially a, a, the equivalent of the Science Museum or something like that. It was meant to show, uh, well, like the Great Exhibition, it was meant to show off great scientific achievements. Um, and, it, uh, and its serious purpose was embodied in its design, including the Moorish design with minarets at the top. Uh, it was meant to be an improving space um, to provide science lessons to the great Victorian public. And it failed. It, it, it went bankrupt within two years. Uh, and so it was turned into an upmarket music hall and circus, the Alhambra Theatre of Varieties. Uh, and in that form, it became extremely popular. Uh, large numbers of Londoners went. Um, uh, it, uh, of course, there were some very expensive seats for the, for the, uh, for the toffs and the men about town, uh, but there were also cheap seats. Um, and, um, uh, and so that meant that um, certainly middle-class people and maybe some working-class people could also get in. Um, what would they see uh, in one evening? Um, uh, they would see um, two ballets, um, and it's worth saying, that ballet flourished in music hall, uh, and it was seen as something that was popular and not rather than the kind of upmarket kind of entertainment it subsequently became. Um, uh, they would see black minstrel uh, troops, they'd see comedians, um, uh, they would um, see performing animals. Uh, and the Alhambra uh, lasted all the way through to 1937, when the building was demolished and it was replaced by the Odeon Leicester Square, uh, still the premier London cinema. So if you think about it, that one site has been providing spectacular entertainment for something like 160 years. And then of course, another dimension to West End entertainments was the kind of exuberant sexuality that uh, uh, it became known for. Uh, I mentioned how George Edwards created the musical comedy, um, and um, he uh, and he had a string of hits at the Gaiety Theatre. Who um, one of the, uh, the characteristics of these um, shows were essentially the chorus girls or the Gaiety girls, um, and um, lots of men uh, would come to see these shows with titles like the Shop Girl, the Gaiety Girl, um, uh, mainly, of course, to gawp at the young women uh, and often try and go round uh, the, the back and try and uh, um, get to see them at the stage door. Um, the first evidence we have of Winston Churchill showing any uh, interest in the opposite sex was when he was at Sandhurst and he went to the, see a show at the Gaiety and then went, went to the stage door and obtained a photograph of one of the Gaiety girls. Um, so um, uh, what we, we see here uh, is the, um, the shows aimed, uh, you know, I mean, there were musical shows, they were, they were comic, um, but their allure was that of these young women who are carefree um, um, and, um, and exuberant. Um, uh, here's another picture uh, of, of the Gaiety girls um, uh, with, uh, with that, um, uh, with, with the line, which takes your fancy. That gives you a sense of the appeal of the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, of the Gaiety girls. Probably the most famous of the Gaiety girls was Gabrielle Ray, who's the, uh, uh, on the top right, who was always seen as the most beautiful of the Gaiety girls. Um, uh, but this culture of spectacle doesn't end there. Um, take Liberties on Re Regent Street, which opened in 1875. Arthur Liberty created um, 
uh, uh, liberties as a shop, uh, which wasn't quite where it is now, by the way. Uh, the Tudor Beethan uh, liberties, which you probably know, uh, did, didn't come along till the 20th century. Uh, but the liberties that the shop um, uh, was based upon a particular look that Arthur Liberty thought was a, a, a that Arthur Liberty derived from pre Raphaelite paintings. He liked the flowing drapery that you get in pre-Raphaelite paintings. Um, and he sold that look to female customers. And Liberties became associated with a new category of person who was emerging in the mid 19th century, the Bohemian. So Liberties sold fabric to um, Victorians who liked to think they had Vic uh, Bohemian tastes. Um, and here is a photograph of the original Arthur Liberty. Um, uh, he was seated down, uh, 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 in, he was seated, um, and, and you can see him in this picture uh, choosing a fabric uh, to be sold in his shops. I discovered this picture in the um, Liberties archives, which are now in the um, uh, City of Westminster archive. Um, uh, and the displays in these in department stores, like Liberties and then later Sovereigners, took on a theatrical quality. Um, people would see them and talk about them as if they were West End shows. One of the in innovations uh, that Harry Gordon Selfridge made when he opened Selfridges uh, was that he insisted the lights uh, in the displays should stay on till midnight. So could, people could window shop of an evening, if, even if they couldn't go into the shop. Um, uh, and so, so places like uh, Liberties uh, and Selfridges felt deeply theatrical. And so did, uh, um, and, and here's another um, great um, department store, uh, Swan and Edgar on uh, Piccadilly Circus. And it wasn't just the department stores that were theatrical. So were restaurants, restaurants like Romano's on the Strand, which was um, De uh, with decorations which were meant to suggest the Eastern Mediterranean, although it also featured uh, a Japanese room on the second floor. And Romano's was very much uh, aimed at men about town uh, in the late 19th century and the sporting set and journalists, men just back from the race course, uh, eager to talk about which horse they'd backed. Um, or on the right, uh, the Trocadero, just off Piccadilly Circus, um, uh, which was one of the grandest uh, restaurants of the period, uh, but one which was at least affordable by the middle classes. Um, and of course, the, um, the um, restaurants were theatrical in other ways. People would have to uh, put on a costume, in other words, evening dress. So, and then there would be the theatricality of ordering. Um, particularly uh, trying to negotiate the, the menu, which was usually in French. And then, of course, there was the theatricality of being able to actually pay the bill. Um, uh, so um, at um, um, uh, Romano's, they're not the Trocadero, which, as I said, was cheaper. Um, uh, Romano's, uh, so a dinner uh, could, uh, for two could set you back about £400 in today's prices. Um, so, uh, so there was still this strongly elite dimension to um, the West End. Uh, I found about um, one spectacular dinner that was put on at the Savoy, where the guests uh, ended up paying the equivalent of fifteen thousand pounds in today's money for a dinner. Um, uh, which um, uh, so that gives you a sense of how lavish the whole thing was. Um, and, um, and, and, and you can see this sort of sense of lavish spectacle here is a supper at the Savoy Hotel. Um, and uh, one of the things I like about the appeal of the Savoy was it was always uh, uh, unafraid of using the exotic. So this, how, this is how they serve Turkish coffee um, or cafe a la Turk. Um, again, you see these people who are dressed up in oriental costumes uh, 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 serving Turkish coffee. Um, so this created the peculiar atmosphere um, that became part of the Pleasure District. This is a, 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 a program for the Adelphi Theatre, um, uh, which um, at the end of the 19th century was owned by the Gatti family, who also owned music halls. And this again, I think, expresses something of the appeal of the West End. And notice how there's a connection made between the theatre and, of course, a, a, a 
lavish restaurant as well. So um, this image, which actually sadly I wasn't able to use in my book, um, so I didn't think it would reproduce very well. Um, this image for me uh, expresses something of what the West End uh, was all about. Uh, it was spectacular, uh, and yet it was also a place for art and for culture. It combined ostentation and vulgarity. It was the site of the populist palatial. Thank you very much.